Today we have Tim Morrison from the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, he received his Master of Fine Arts in Theatrical Design from Northwestern. Um, he has over two decades of experience working as a scenic designer in Chicago. His designs have been on stage at numerous companies including Remy Bumpo, Northlight, Looking Glass, Victory Gardens, and Apple Tree Theaters. Uh, he also worked as an exhibited artist showing in the Tweet Home Chicago contest, as well as Comed's Metamorphages Public Art Exhibit, which featured a 1950 refrigerator that he redesigned as a solar-powered cell phone charging station. Um, in 2010, he returned to Northwestern um, to get an MS in product design and development, and he combines the worlds of art, design, and innovation, and he joined the Museum of Science and Industry as the director for the Chicago Incubator for Innovation in 2013. So please welcome Mr. Tim Morrison. Thank you very much. Uh, as Andrea said, I'm the director of the Chicago Incubator for Innovation. It's at the Museum of Science and Industry. I want to thank you for taking time this morning to join me. I know that you had another choice this morning, the learning, exploiting, and benchmarking problem structures and real valued evolutionary optimization. I have no idea what that is. I'm glad you're here instead. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is talk to you about this project, which is the art of science learning. Uh, kind of explain the thinking behind the project, uh, the structure, how it's going to work, opportunities for you to participate, and then the impacts that we hope to have with the project. Uh, so what is the art of science learning? Uh, it is funded by the National Science Foundation, and it is a national, I have to read this, I haven't memorized it yet, I apologize. It is a national initiative that uses the arts to spark creativity in science education and the development of an innovative 21st century STEM workforce. This is kind of grant speak. This is the language from the grant. Uh, I prefer to think of this as a project where we're going to spend 11 months at the intersection of art, science, creativity, and innovation to see how we can change people's thinking. The idea is to share and to learn from one another. And the two real key parts, obviously, are art and science. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the thinking that went into this project and how we feel that the art and the science are linked. Um, this is from a study done in 2008. Nobel laureates are more likely to practice the arts than typical scientists. I don't like the word typical. I don't think any of you are typical, but that's the language here. The idea was they looked at the avocation, the artistic avocation of Nobel laureates, and they found that they were two times more likely to be photographers, four times more likely to be musicians, and up to 25 times more likely to be writers. The researchers for the project made a connection between their artistic, the artistic pursuits of the Nobel laureates and the results of their work. The researchers felt that those artistic pursuits improved the scientific skills and outputs of the Nobel laureates. Um, I want to be careful as I talk about this and not create the impression that the artists have the answer for the scientists. That's not what this project's about. That's not what I believe. What I believe is artists have been trained and use creative tools, tools that can be used by many other people in many other fields to inform their work. A nice example of this is a, a study that was done in pictorial perception. Uh, two subject groups were taken and uh, asked to look at this image and several other images with the goal of recalling the image and details about the image for later questions. One group was non-arts trained. The second group had art training. The image on the screen right now is how a non-art trained subject looked at the image. The yellow lines are eye movements captured through eye tracking technology. So what you're seeing is how they looked at the image. The arts trained observer, a much different way of looking at the image. I'll go back. So this is the non-arts trained person. This is the arts trained person. You can see the arts trained person is looking at the whole image. They're not just looking at the person that's a little off center in the middle of the image. So it's the idea that artists have been trained and artists use different tools. It's their power of observation in this case to see the full image. In the results of the research or the testing, um, both groups recalled the image equally well, but the art trained subject people 
recalled the details of the image much more clearly. So spatial thinking is at the heart of many great discoveries in science and underpins many of the activities of the modern workforce. This is from a National Research Council report. Spatial thinking is kind of a big term. It's used to cover a lot of things. A more specific example of this is a study that was done using the Purdue Spatial Visualization Test, which is essentially um, asking subjects, asking people to look at an object, mentally rotate that object to come up with an alternate view of that object. So it's their ability to mentally manipulate an object to come up with a new view. This study was done with engineering students who had performed poorly on the initial test. You can see the results here, median score. They went through then 20 hours of drawing training and they took the same test and their median scores improved by about 30 points. Again, the researchers for this study made a rela uh, drew a relationship between the drawing training and the improved spatial visualization skills of the subjects. Um, so I think there's, we think for the project, there's a connection between the art and the science and that these art, arts tools, the creativity tools can be used by scientists, but it also has a place beyond just the science. It's also in society as a whole, specifically preparing a STEM workforce for success in the 21st century. A workforce that has to deal with the speed of change and unpredictability, the ideas and the issues of globalization, the need for creativity, collaboration and communication, and then the need to be innovative, which is kind of a hot word right now. Um, I think at one point recently I heard about an airline that has innovative seats. It's kind of a word used everywhere, but the fact of the matter is it is an important and a valid word because for a lot of companies, for a lot of people, the only competitive advantage they have is to be more innovative than the next person. 400 American corporations were asked the tools that they felt their employees needed to have. Communication, teamwork, creativity. And these are some of the tools that we feel the arts can help with. When asked, did their employees have strengths in these areas, the response was not very good. So that's sort of how we feel for the project, there's a connection between the art and the science. Now we're going to make a connection between innovation and art, and that is sort of the heart of the art of science learning. The program is going to be using a newly designed innovation curriculum that uses art-based tools to improve people's ability to think creatively, their critical analysis skills, and their collaborative team abilities. Uh, and we're going to start by using a standard innovation process. This is a process that's often used in product design and development in corporate settings. And it's a very standard process. It begins with opportunity identification, analysis, idea generation, and enrichment, idea selection, design and development, business and market planning, testing, and launch. It's a very straightforward process. It's a process that can also be used in many, many different settings. And what the art of science learning is going to do is that each step in this process, we're going to integrate an arts-based learning tool, ranging from jazz to movement, sculpture to theater. The idea is that, that each step in the innovation process we pair it with a tool that's sympathetic to the activities that occur at that point in the process. I'm going to go through a few examples of this because people, this is sort of the head scratching point. People say, it sounds interesting, but how exactly do you pair an arts-based tool with one of these steps? And the first one is jazz and opportunity identification. As you begin the process, you need to identify an opportunity. You need to decide what ideas you're going to pursue, not necessarily even what questions you're ask, going to ask, but what questions do you need to ask, how are you going to ask them, how do you form all of that. Through jazz and jazz improvisation, it gives you the ability for theme and pattern recognition, improves your observational skills, and then your ability to express those observations through metaphor. So the idea is, Participants in the program will go through a series of exercises in jazz, improvisation, and that should improve their ability then 
to identify opportunities. A second example is curation and idea selection. One of the activities that you do in this innovation process is a series of divergent and convergent thinking. Let's come up with a lot of ideas, essentially a brainstorming, come up with many ideas, converge on some of them, repeat that step, diverge, and converge. At some point, you have to decide which ideas you're going to pursue, which can be a difficult thing to do. Uh, what if, to make those selections, you started thinking as a curator, as a gallery curator, or as an artistic director? So those people have to take, make, analytic, make decisions using analytic and intuitive criteria for objective and subjective judgments, and then apply those to the marketplace. For a gallery owner, they have some art that they want to display. They have to make a decision, both an objective and a subjective decision, about is that art good? They want to put it on the wall. And they also, frankly, perhaps want to sell that art. So how are their decisions both going to evaluate the work and then relate to placing that work into the marketplace? A third example is theater and business planning. Through the innovation process, you're going to reach a point where you have to advance your idea forward. How are you going to do that? Theater gives you the ability to define, identify, and target an audience, develop your messaging skills, and audience engagement techniques. The audience isn't necessarily one audience in any of these situations. It's going to be the people you're working with, the people you're trying to get funding from, the people who are gonna ultimately use your idea. So theater can give you the ability to define those audience members, and then it will give you the ability to develop messaging specifically for them and then it will help you engage those audience members so they really understand the message and understand what you're trying to say, what you're trying to explain, what you're trying to get them to do. So th those are three examples I hope that sort of give you some idea of how the art-based tools will work in that space. Now we try and put the art and the science together. And that's going to happen at three incubators for innovation. Uh, this is a nationally um, conducted program. It'll be sited here in Chicago at the Museum of Science and Industry, in San, San Diego at the Balbo Balboa Cultural Park, and in Worcester, Massachusetts at an institution called the Egotarium. At all three of these sites, we will be implementing the curriculum that I just discussed. In Chicago, we're going to be starting in January 2014, and it'll continue through December 2014. We're going to assemble a group of 100 people scientists, artists, engineers, designers, community leaders, uh, teachers and educators, high school and college students, corporate innovators, business professionals. We're gonna put this group together and they're going to go through the curriculum. And this is the spot where there's a possibility for any of you to participate in the program. We're trying to have a diverse group in the room so that there are great conversations amongst all of the people. Um, it's trying to reflect the Chicago community, each of the three incubators will reflect their community. You're a part of the Chicagoland community. You have an opportunity to participate and be in the room with all of these different people. Once we've got the group of 100 put together, they're gonna to go through 12 workshops led by national experts in innovation and creativity. And that's where they will learn the new creativity tools based on the art-based exercises um, that are paired with that entire innovation process. And then, out of that group of 100 people, we're going to assemble 10 innovation teams focused on two innovation challenges over the course of five months of development time. Those teams will also be guided by team mentors. And the, these innovation challenges are really where we try to make that connection between the art and the science. Uh, for Chicago, we have chosen Two challenges, the first one is urban nutrition in Chicago, essentially fair and equal access to nutrition across the city of Chicago. And the goal is to have five innovation teams use the tools that they have learned to come up with a STEM-based response solution to the urban nutrition. The second challenge is a little fuzzier at this point it will be firmed up by the time the program starts, but it is to produce five self-contained STEM learning projects 
that can be used in an informal science education environment, such as the Museum of Science and Industry, or perhaps a more formal uh, education environment. But with both of these challenges, the idea is to use the tools, the creative tools, the thinking tools that they've been taught through the program and have STEM-based responses to these two challenges. And these are not white paper projects. The goal is at the end of the 11 months of this project, there are five ready-to-go, viable, implementable solutions for urban nutrition and five ready-to-use, ready-to-advance into the marketplace, if you will, STEM learning projects. In Chicago, the sequence will be, starting in January of 2014, there will be five workshops from January to March which focus on the front-end tools, which are those tools of opportunity identification and analysis, idea generation, et cetera. We'll go through a front-end period uh, with those tools, and then the teams will, at that point, the teams will have formed, and they will go through a couple of months of front-end development. They will pick the challenges that they're interested in working on, and they will begin to apply those tools, uh, apply the tools they've learned to those challenges. They will come back for one workshop in communication, and they're going to reach stage gate one. This entire project, as I said, borrows an innovation process, a standard process. It also uses a stage gate structure, which is from the same corporate um, background. The idea is there are go, no go decision points along the way. Stage gate one, they will present their work up to this point to a panel. The panel will look at it and judge its viability, its use of the art-based learning tools, and its integration of STEM content. At that point, they'll either get a go or no-go decision. If it's a no-go decision, they'll get a little time to rework. Once it's a go, we move on to some more workshops. From May through June, uh, it's the design and development tools that they will be taught. And then from June to October, the teams will spend time on their own, guided by a mentor, developing their solutions to the two challenges. So they'll have, it's about five months of work on the urban nutrition solution or five months to develop STEM learning projects. They come back, have a workshop in October on prototyping and product testing. They'll have a month then to use those tools to test their solutions, their products, if you will, and they will go through stage gate two. Again, a go, no-go decision point. We get beyond that to December, and we have a workshop and product launch. And as I said, the hope is by the time we get to December, there are solutions ready to use, to implement for urban nutrition or to use for STEM learning projects. Uh, the benefits of participating in this program, it's a couple of things. People are going to learn these art-based tools, which are really tools of creativity, how to think, how to observe, how to communicate. They're also going to get an education in innovation, uh, a process that I think can be used in a lot of different places, because it's really just about how do you generate ideas, how do you evaluate ideas, how do you plan to move those ideas forward, how do you communicate those ideas. So they're going to get both the innovation training, but they're also going to get these new ways of thinking creatively. Uh, it's a chance to collaborate with a diverse group. There are going to be a lot of different people in the room. We're hoping that there are great conversations and that people have the opportunity to learn from each other, to share with each other, to network with each other, and we hope that once the incubator is done, that the conversations that begin with the program continue beyond uh, the December ending of this. Uh, certification as an innovation fellow, everyone will go through the program, they will get certification in this. We're tossing in a one-year family membership to the Museum of Science and Industry just because that's kind of fun. Um, there's going to be an entire series of public programming events that will go along in conjunction with this, um, the art of science learning while the incubator is up and running. Uh, and they're going to be looking at this intersection of art, science, creativity, and innovation. And anyone who is going through the program will have access to those events. Um, University of California, San Diego is offering continuing education credit for not only the San Diego program, but they have extended that um, credit to, or the possibility of getting credit to all three sites. So San Diego, Chicago, and Worcester will be eligible for continuing ed credit. 
Uh, we think that this is a great uh, unique credit on anyone's academic record or resume. It's not the kind of program that people are going to run across very frequently, so I think it'll look good on someone's record. Uh, and it's a chance to contribute to the community through the innovation challenges uh, to try and have an effect, particularly on the urban nutrition in Chicago. The commitment for the program, it is tuition free. The National Science Foundation grant covers all of the costs of the faculty, administration, logistics, material, et cetera. So there is no fee to go through the program. We anticipate about 150 hours of commitment to the program. That's between the workshop sessions that take place and then the team-driven work. And it's a little unclear exactly how long it will take just because the teams are going to work in their own manner. So that's going to have an effect on the total time for the program. Uh, People need to be able to commit to the incubator schedule, which is going to include 12 to 15 Saturday sessions, just because the only way to get all of these different people in the room at one time is to do it on Saturdays. The majority of those sessions will take place at the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, everyone who enters the program has to be willing to work collaboratively. That's one of the things that will make this program work and it's one of the exciting things about the program is the opportunity to work with each other, to work across disciplines and skill sets to focus on these ideas. So it's really critical that everyone who comes in understands that and is excited by that idea. Um, there will be a program application going up online in a couple of weeks, so anyone who's interested in applying, there's going to be a fairly simple application just so we have an idea of where people are coming from, what their backgrounds are and what their interests are and goals uh, for participating. Beyond the direct impact on the individuals and the communities, we feel there's a greater impact possible with this program. The individuals, the impact will be learning these new ways of thinking, the creative ways of thinking, learning an innovation process. On the community, the impact can be through the two innovation challenges, the urban nutrition and the STEM learning projects. But there's also the possibility for a greater impact and that will come in helping to answer the question, does arts-based learning affect the creativity, collaborative behavior and innovative outputs of STEM learners and practitioners? The idea of this program is to train, to implement this curriculum, but also to see what happens with it, to see its effect on people. Has it improved their ability be, to be creative? And has it worked with a wide range of people who have gone through the program? We're gonna do that by questioning and measuring. Questioning, did the curriculum strengthen people's innovation skills? Did it generate innovative solutions and did it increase the understanding of create, the role of creativity in STEM education and learning? It'll be measured with pre and post surveys, ethnographic research throughout the course of the program, and then assessments of the solutions that the teams produce. Um, not only will they go through the stage gate, but once the program is finished, people will look at these solutions and judge, um, were they really innovative and were they the result of this curriculum? Uh, that is about it. I found one quote as I was preparing this that I kind of like, and I'll finish with that. Um, it was written, uh, or it's from a metallurgist at MIT, and it says, I have slowly come to realize that the analytic quantitative approach I had been taught to regard as the only respectable one for a scientist is insufficient. The richest aspects of any large and complicated system arise from factors that cannot be measured easily, if at all. For these, the artist's approach, uncertain though it inevitably is, seems to find and convey more meaning. So I will be happy to answer questions now that we're done. Um, I do have an info sheet that you can take away with you. And if you're interested in getting more information about this project as it moves forward and maybe even applying, um, I'll have a list and you can leave your name and email and I'll make sure that you get on a mailing list so I can keep you updated. That's it. Yeah, I have a few questions, and uh, please don't take this as a destructive criticism or anything, you know. Just, I wonder, I mean, looking at this last slide, this mm -hmm. uh, quote mm -hmm. saying that uh, the crucial things cannot be measured, and then the slide before that, you said that there should be a rigorous testing and measuring after the uh, uh, success of this program. So how does that fit together? 
That is a good question, and that's one of the difficult things about dealing with this subject. There's a lot of anecdotal data, a lot of sort of qualitative data about the effectiveness of these sorts of tools on people's abilities, on their creative abilities. The goal of the program is to try and produce more quantitative. What I didn't talk about is there's a component, a separate component of this program, which is going to be a tightly controlled study. It's going to take um, a group of high school students and it is going to give them a standard innovation curriculum training and then the arts-based tools version of the same curriculum. It's also going to do that with early career professionals. So we're going to have the, this research study going on in the midst of this. And they're two separate things, but that smaller research study is where the leadership of this program, the national director, is hoping to start to generate some of that data. So that, more tightly controlled with the larger study, try and measure what, as you've pointed out, is kind of a slippery subject to deal with. Yeah, uh, kind of a related question. So, um, I mean, I understand that the funding agencies want something, you know, to, to, to justify the expense. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's a given. But uh, how do you measure long-term success? So a high school kid who goes through such a program might invent something 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, that cannot be captured in any of these, uh, you know, immediate studies. Right. The study at this point, the incubator ends in December. It's a rolling incubator, all three sites. So the last one will end sometime in February, March or February 2015. All of the data that comes out of this will be packaged, will be evaluated, packaged, and then disseminated. Beyond that, I believe there, is, there are plans to try and track some of these people long term. I don't know that that has been laid out yet, because this is really just this part of the project at this point has been funded and structured up through the end of the incubators and then publishing, evaluating and publishing the data that comes out of them. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. I find this a fantastic program. It's just, you know, when I voice criticism, it's just to, to you know, Absolutely. hoping to bring some, you know, additional input into it. Yes, uh, being immersed with people from the arts sounds like a great idea. It was unclear from the layout just uh, how that immersion was going to occur. In other words, how many people from the different arts are, is one going to be surrounded by in this? It's, it's not trying to immerse everyone, with, sort of surround them with the artists, but it's to take a diverse group that includes the artists and the scientists, engineers, students, business professionals, and sort of immerse all of them in these art-based learning experiences to give them the creative tools. Um, so we want to have, go, I'm sorry, you? No, you, okay. carry on. I mean, you look like you want to ask more of a question. It's, I guess for me, the important thing about it is it's not that we're saying the artist has the answer, that the artist has the tools that the scientists need. It's as I said before, artists have creative tools that they use. And those tools, I think, are the important piece. And it's teaching those tools, seeing how those tools can be applied by anybody else that's gonna be the interesting part of this. So it's using the arts to explore these creative ways of thinking and then offer those creative ways of thinking to a wide range of people. I would suggest you make sure the scientists are outnumbered because uh, <laughs> uh, We're trying to balance it. We're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna try and balance the room, believe find, me. find stubborn artists. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I did not hear you about anything about the brain imaging. Because you want to find, to address the same concern, the how the kids can do ma better in math and science. Mm -hmm. What kind of brain you need for that? And then say which art projects can develop those brains? Look at differently so you can focus. And when you do the art project, you have a result. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about whether you get a result or not because you are developing that part of the brain. 
Some of that thinking has been used. Harvey Seifter, who is the director and principal investigator for the project, has done, looked at some of that research, and I think he has integrated it into some of the tools. Okay. And the tools have been picked so that the activity that's going on in that specific step in the process, the tool sort of relates specifically to how the thinking will occur. I mean, the jazz is a good example of that um, with the pattern recognition. The whole creativity, what parts of the brain are we using, I'm, I will not profess to have any skill in that. I know that's what some of the research is looking at. That's not specifically a part of this. There, there's work being done, and this is really just, it's to implement. It's to take this curriculum, implement it, and see what happens. Why don't you use it to measure the results? Um, I suspect because it would get too complicated and expensive for, um, I mean, this is a relatively ambitious program to begin with, bringing 100 people together in three different cities, doing the curriculum. So I think there were kind of limits to what could be done. Um, and it'll be interesting to see then. Another comment. Some of the art examples you gave, but some of the sports, some of the games can be a part of the art, like a video game. Mm -hmm. It does develop your spatial thinking. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be included because kids may be more interested. And you, you serve the purpose mm -hmm. of developing their math and science skills. But using the tools, they, they also like to play with. Right. Again, the, the structure for this comes from the people who've designed the curriculum, <clears throat> excuse me, and they want it to be done as a group. They, all of these exercises are relatively active, if you will, and they're done in a collaborative setting. So that is the approach that they've taken from the beginning, and that's how they've stu structured this curriculum to try and achieve their goals. And a similar thing about your other topic, urban nutrition. I just read an article how to have junk food with a nutritional value. Mm -hmm. so this is just like a video game. Have something they like to have, and still it serves your purpose. Yeah. We'll see what, the, what solutions the teams come up with. So are you looking for kind of an extended community around these people to, to add resources? Or, I mean, what that, that could be where Argonne could come in. To provide. That would be great. I mean, specifically, we're looking for participants in the program, the right. 100 people who will go through it. We're looking for each of the teams is going to have a mentor. So also what I'm sort of looking for as I talk to people are people who would have skills as mentors to coach and facilitate teams. We're also looking for people who can provide us with support and the teams with support around the two subject areas, the urban nutrition right. and the idea of STEM learning projects. So if we can extend the community to include Argonne for, to satisfy some of those needs, that would be great as well. Because with both of the, the um, challenge topics, we can't just say, go do this. Right. We have to give them information, but we need to do it quickly and efficiently, but not to the point where we sort of determine what they're going to do. So developing that information is going to be key as well. Okay. How's this related to the STEAM efforts? Um, I think it's related in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, the STEAM effort, so we have STEM to STEAM, the movement to integrate the arts into STEM. Uh, I think, and I might be stepping in it a little bit here, I think sometimes the STEM people get a little, they feel like they've gotten themselves going with the whole STEM thing, and now the arts are trying to sort of jump in there. Um, this is an attempt to, obviously, integrate the arts into STEM education, um, and I think it can be used to evaluate and further this idea of integrating the arts. Um, and I mean, I keep saying it, and I really think it's just teaching people how to think creati creatively and give them tools that they can apply and that can be integrated into STEM learning and practice. An administrative question that you may not be the person to answer, but I think it is very important. And this is at the danger of uh, squashing creativity, but administrative stuff, unfortunately, does come in. So uh, for an Argonne employee to put a significant amount of time, like these 12 to 15 weekends, 
into the program, uh, there should be some kind of support from Argon management. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, they will look at it, why is this person spent, you know, we are paying this person's salary and uh, that person is doing you know, some funny stuff. Uh, so uh, is there some way that uh, through NSF or MSI or something, Argon could be made aware of this, that this is beneficial to Argon, and uh, that there's like word from Argon management to support this activity. And that's some of what I'm starting to do today by just coming here and talking about the project. Our hope is as we start getting people interested and they say, I would like to do this, how can we go about getting support from my employer? That we can have a conversation to try and come up with something. The program cannot obviously pay for people to be a part of this. It's tuition free, but that's as far as we can go. Our hope is to be able to work with employers, explain the value of this program to the point where the institutions realize that this is a great program for their employees because it's going to teach them innovation, it's going to teach them creative thinking, it's going to give them ability to approach their work from new points of view. Basically, how does this activity fit into Argonne's mission statement? That's a good question. I don't know Argonne's mission statement, to be honest with you. So, <laughs> so that's a discussion that if people are interested, then I would pursue with um, I assume up the up the chain a little bit. We'll find a way. Anybody else? Oh. Again, thank you for taking time this morning. Uh, as I said, I have information sheets you're welcome to take away. Share this with anyone that you know if you think it's not right for, for you but we good for somebody else, please let them know. And there's also a list here if you would like. I will keep you on an email list. Thank you very much.